Welcome to another Word in Your Ear. Now, journalists and PRs tend to be um, two separate species. Gamekeepers and poachers. <laughs> <surely>. <laughs> and poachers, precisely. But we're, we're, enjoyed, we're joined by an old pal who's, uh, who's, who's uh, dealt with musicians on both sides of the fence. Head gamekeeper. Head gamekeeper. Surely. Very much so. Absolutely. <laughs> Top of the heap. And, uh, yeah, she was one of the first uh, female writers on uh, Rolling Stone and and Enemy and Sounds in the 70s, and went on to be one of the key music publishers, the person that David and I, over the years, used to call when desperately seeking Madonna or R.E.M. or Depeche Mode of Candle Service. And she's just written a book about her life story called Access All Areas. Uh, most of it apparently spent recovering from enormous hangovers. And it's Barbara Sharon, BC. How are you? Very nice to see you. I'm not hungover. Okay, for a change, for a change. Yeah. There's a bit in the book where you say that the idea of the book started with Bobby, a phone call from Bobby Gillespie. Okay. So what, what happened there? What was that about? Oh, um, he actually texted me when we were in um, the first begin first uh, throes of lockdown, saying he just read um, an interview I'd done in the probably mid seventies, probably for Sounds uh, or Crawdaddy with uh, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, and he said I should put my Keith Richards book out again, which I said, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to write my own story, the BC story. So he said, oh, well, let me introduce you to my friend, Lee Braxton, who uh, is a publisher and has his own imprint, White Rabbit. And the rest is history. Uh, Lee was great. He got me an agent. Uh, mo mostly um, I took the agent because she does Grace Dent, who I, I think is a really great writer. <clears throat> and off I went. I had a deal within about a month and, and um, yeah, like everyone else wrote, wrote it. It was one of the good things to come out of lockdown. Right. Good for you. Now look, we're going to transport you back to your childhood in, in Chicago. And it's really interesting that you know, you've always been an, you know, you're an American now living in, 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 in Britain, but you've always been a, a, an Anglophile. So the household you grew up in, you were talking about watching that was the week that was and beyond the fringe and things. How did that happen? Why, why were you all so interested in, in, in British culture? Well, um, my parents were, I was lucky. I grew up in a house full of music. And also my parents used to go to New York and go to the theater. So they saw Beyond the Fringe and, um, you know, they used to come back and buy the cast albums. And they also had the New Yorker and the New York Times. So it was, you know, they were very well read and they appreciated the arts and it obviously rubbed off on me. The British part, was more just growing up in the era that I did with, you know, it was such a great, everything. It just looked so, I had such a romantic vision of England. You know, um, the man from Uncle and James Bond and all the Bob, groups. Bobby's on bicycles, red pillar yeah. boxes. <laughs> red Fantastic. buses. Yeah. And, and obviously the, the, the British invasion made a huge impact on you. You talk about seeing the Beatles when you were, I don't know, 11 or whatever it was they arrived. So what was it about? Was there a different sensibility about the British groups, the Stones and the, and, and the Beatles and stuff compared to the American group? Did they have a certain Yeah, I mean, at the time when the Beatles started, I think the American groups were like Paul Revere and the Raiders and, you know, kind of shit. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I once bought my sister for Christmas tickets to Herman's Hermits so I could see the Hollies who were the supporters. Oh, that. really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, the first American music that I kind of remember before, like, there were Be the Beach Boys and stuff was pretty much folk, you know, um, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Um, also, going back to my parents, there were a lot of acerbic folk groups like um, the Chad Mitchell Trio and... Um, some of the, I think there was that Tommy Makem from Ireland, who my dad loved, the Clancy brothers, but all, all of that was a little political. Um, yeah, the new Christy Minstrels, it was crazy, but I really love music. What was the first act you remember seeing? God, I don't remember that, and I have a good memory. Um, I, I don't remember you that. Couldn't have made much of an impression. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it was Herman's Hermits. <laughs> yeah, you remember the first single you bought? Oh yeah, um, I think the first single I bought was Bobby Darren, um, probably Mac the Knife, I think. Um, huh. And then, 
the first album I bought was Meet the Beatles. And then I would like, um, like I love the Stones and I would buy a Rolling Stones album. And then when the second one came out, I'd buy that. And then my parents would be, why do you need another one? Why do you need two? That's right. Yeah, you've already got one of those. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> you kind of had a point with the first two yeah, Rolling yeah. Stones album. Which yeah. was, the first one's a lot better than the second one. <laughs> so how did you first start sort of writing about music? I wrote, well, when I was, um, I had also a romantic vision, I think, of journalists. Um, I had a little, <laughs> I know, it didn't last long. I had a little printing <laughs> press and, my first boyfriend was called Stuart Shaman, which I just love that name. Right. He should have been a rock star. And we used to like make these little papers, you know, in this little like printing press with like, I guess, little letters and ink. Um, but I started to write in high school, I guess. I, I had a column my senior year in the, in the high school newspaper. What was it called, your column? Did it have a, a name? Um... I could. I have some copies of it. I don't think so, but it must be poptastic with Barbara Sharon or something. Well, no, I'd write about issues in the school, like um, oh, right. once uh, a lot of female bathrooms were closed, so the headline was "Mystery <laughs> of the Locked Bathrooms, Nowhere to Go." Um, <laughs> but I also wrote a lot about music for the high school paper, and then um, I used to spend all my money. Uh, I always had, um, I always had like a weekend job. Um, first at the library and then eventually at a, a record store in the little v suburb that we lived in. So um, I spent all my money on records and concert tickets. You know, there wasn't any internet then. So you, and when the tickets went on sale at 9.30, you had to like use the telephone yep. and, um, or go to the record, record store. Or go to the record store. Yeah, yeah the record yeah, store, the record store used yeah. to. So instead of being at school at 9.30, I'd be buying tickets to Mata Hoople or whoever it was. What was the name of the record shop you worked in? Can you remember? It got, it's got a great name. It was called Wally King's Record Store. Wally King. Yeah, and Wally good. and his wife, um, they were really lovely people. So, yeah, I worked there. Um, I mean, record stores, it's like, um, you know, that Nick Hornby book and movie, yeah. Fidelity. It's really like that. It's, um, you know, the record stores were where you used to hang out and, and they had uh, music papers and, you know, Rolling Stone had started. And, um, but yeah, I, um, I accosted the music critic for the Chicago Sun-Times at a show and said, I want to do what you do when I grow up. And he said, oh, well, if you have any ideas, send them in. And within about a week, I'd send in a, a column on um, James Taylor, who was, you know, out of nowhere, kind of became the story in America with his background and the, the song Fire and Rain about a friend's suicide. And it, and it got printed. So within like two weeks, I had an article printed in um, the Chicago Sun-Times. So I was like, this is so easy. Were you, were you <laughs> thrilled? Can you remember how you felt? Yeah, ecstatic. When I saw your name in, in print. Yeah, I went, to the, uh, went and bought the paper, you know, furiously looking for the entertainment section. Yeah, when I saw my byline, you know, I still have that thrill um, on the other side now with um, artists I work on, especially like if it's a new artist and you get the first little bit of press or you get the Guardian playlist. Um, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess our byline in a paper you know, it's a bit like an artist going on stage. It's it's what drives you, really. It's unbelievably thrilling. But you moved over to Britain in 72, I think, and did do a, a kind of university course, and you started writing for the NME. So how did that yeah, come when about? I, how well, when, you... I came, when I came to London, um, I, the guy, Al Rudis, said to me, when you go to England, send me anything. So I would send stories on bands that were going to tour Chicago, uh, would play in Chicago. So I started getting quite a few things in the Chicago paper. And then through that meeting, like I met Moira, who was working in the press office at Warner Brothers. And then probably six months into being in England, I was here for a year. Um, I, you know, I'd meet journalists at press receptions. And so the enemy, I'd meet lots of people from enemy. And 
I basically um, just bug the shit out of them. I, you know, you have to be very tenacious. And I called <laughs> constantly. And eventually they said they gave me a try. Can, can I just interject at this point? <laughs> this book, if this book was going to have another title, it should have been You Have to Be Tenacious. <laughs> because we, we all know. <laughs> The defining characteristic of BC is she is tenacious. She does not give up. She does <laughs> not give up, which I'm sure is highly, high, no higher recommendation to her, yeah. cli to her clients. Yeah. Uh, but all wants, you they, used to when BC, the smash when BC say, gets on your case, she does not go away. Yeah, Absolutely. You, you used to raise up the smash and say, get them to do this interview. And if, if the single isn't a hit, you don't have to run the piece, but do the interview anyway. <laughs> So exactly. There's talk. always ways, but someone once said it's just easier to just give in and say yes to me than argue. I think it is. Did it you is. find, though, seriously, you had a kind of edge coming to the UK where people kind of avoid those those sort of confrontations, you know, that particularly when you're dealing with music journalists, that they, they're they not wildly tenacious, are they? Is that fair to say? Yeah, and I think being American in England was a really big advantage for me. Um because English people are probably a little more, <clears throat> less tenacious and less, uh, more hesitant to push it. If they get a no, it's a no. Yeah. And, you know, you just can't operate like that. <laughs> Whereas you think a no is just a kind of, it's a bit of a come on. Yeah, it's it? falling for a fight. <laughs> <laughs> what you have to do is you have to try and get it to be a yes. And there's a yeah. point when, you, when even I have to give up. Yeah, you know, you, you, and you you have to just admit defeat. When was I that? To, I want to know when was the point when you gave up. I never, I never experienced it. <laughs> well, I miss. I mean, I miss Smash Hits a lot, and it's funny. Um, uh, Mark Ronson, uh, who I work with and who was nice enough to read the book, his favorite part was the whole Smash Hits era. You know, when you think about. I think I talk about that a lot. And, you know, Neil Tennant, who's a good friend of all of ours, you know, you guys used to come around our office at Warner Brothers and because you, you didn't have a TV. Well, I think, I think it's an interesting, but <laughs> we should put it on record, TV, actually, that, that, that Smash Hits was so underfunded, we didn't have a video player. And at that time, we used to get sent videos, didn't we, Dave, of, you know, Duran Duran or Spandau Ballet, and we think, uh, oh, we had no idea what they look like. So we had to go around to your office to have a look. And it was on the basis of seeing them in your on your video player that we decided well, to put them in the magazine the and possibly and launch yeah. their careers. Who knows? And watch Top of the Pops. We don't yeah, right. mind. Bitch about everybody. Yeah. And then also, you didn't get the midweeks, so I would give you the midweeks. No, that's the true. Midweeks. That's true, you did. That's Which I'm true. sure you made up. I'm sure you'd say, oh, all the Warner Brothers <laughs> singles are crashing in at top five. They had. So if it was like Howard Jones or one of my artists, I'd I'd say, yeah, the midweek's up, even if it was down. Yeah, yeah. Because so you, you'd have to plan the features. We we're so easy to con. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you a bit about, um, uh, David, I was talking about this last night, actually. There's a bit where you talk about the circle of trust in the book. It really interested me about you uh, interviewing Eric Clapton. And now Eric Clapton was drinking a special brew at 10 o'clock in the morning. There was that thing back then that you had huge amounts of access, but there was a kind of tacit understanding that you wouldn't write about stuff that was in any way really detrimental. Yeah, that you wouldn't overstep the mark. And I think um, that's why you got the access, obviously, because um, you just didn't push it. Um, and it, it, was, it was incredible in terms of access, especially when you think of, how things are now, probably made worse by Zoom. Um, but it was, um, yeah, I was privy to all sorts of things. But you know, when you think about it, when I was coming up, there were four music papers, weekly papers in England, four. Yeah. So when artists um, had solo albums, especially, you know, they were really grateful, you know, like all the guys in the Who did solo albums. and especially probably Roger and John Atwell. So they were seemingly really pleased and, you know, said thanks so much for the support. But when did, when did that end? Like, it's really interesting. You, you go out, you do all these pieces, you go on the road with bands, there'll be a lot of debauchery, a lot of drug taking, a lot. And it was up to you to decide what you'd put in. Some of which went in because it was kind of acceptable at the time and it was really entertaining to read about. But when did that end? Was that to do with the tabloids getting involved with 
writing about press in the mid 80s after Live Aid? I mean, when, I when did that relationship could, end? I don't know if you could pinpoint it, but it probably ended the 90s. It, looking back on the last 40 years or so, the 90s are not held in high esteem or as high esteem, I think, as some of the other decades. So quite possibly, you know, like when I think of in the 90s, R.E.M., who I don't think get anywhere near the recognition their legacy deserves now, um, were huge then. But, you know, I remember, you know, as you know, if you interviewed Michael ever, he was someone that, someone once said to me about Michael Stipe, he's really great till you turn the tape recorder on. So I think that that um, wanting to protect yourself uh, and, and kind of keep the enigma going, maybe started in the 90s. Right. But you know, like Madonna, once you know, she came in, did those interviews, did smash hits, assuming the single would chart. And, um, and then probably that was very brief, her time of even doing press. So when, when you got- sign people up to represent them as a press officer, there's, a, there's equations and there's, there's their kind of talent uh, the music they make, whatever, and there's their appetite to succeed. So which of those two things is more important? In taking someone on? Yeah. Uh, well, I always want to listen to the music. And um, obviously I like some artists' music on that I work with more than others. You know, now that I have my own company, at Warner's I had to work with who was on the label. But the beauty of having your own company is you can choose so, you know, we work with lots of acts that are relatively unknown. You have to like the music. I think you also these days have to like the manager. You spend so much time talking to the manager. Um, you know, if they're realistic and really good at their job, it makes makes your life better. Also, like when you have a roster, variety is, is obviously a really good thing. And variety is great just in terms of, you know, I wouldn't want to have a whole roster full of people that could only be in the broadsheets or could only be in the tabloids. Yeah. It's really good to have, or just Kerrang. Um, You know, so it's good to have a mix. Who have been the people who've been the kind of most surprisingly good clients, you know, that kind of really worked to, you know, when you've asked them to do anything for a press, they've done it and they've done it wholeheartedly and really well. Yeah, I think pop now, funny enough, talking about the era of smash hits, but, Pop kind of has a bad name. So I would say like Ali Mers, who I, I work with and have worked with for about, I think six years. Ali's just um, fantastic, um, hardworking, lovely person. And also for me, it was really great to kind of um, get him some of the credit that he deserves in the press, instead of people thinking he was just a kind of somebody that was on X Factor. Right. You know, right. people like Rufus Wainwright, lots of, uh, I love all those, lots of singer songwriters, like we all do, great lyrics. And, you know, a lot of those people that the broadsheets like writing about don't sell very many records. You know, one manager once said to me, good reviews are great, but they don't pay for dinner. No, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But the good reviews are still even though the papers and the magazines don't sell anything like as many copies as they used to, certainly not in you know, physical form, the reviews are still really important to the artist, aren't they? Is that fair to say? I think they're, yes. Also, they're important to the label, to the whole process of, of what we all do. I mean, you'll still see on a big album where the label has money, page ads with all, or even sometimes two posters with all those four star reviews. Yeah. We're so lucky. We still have a media. I mean, one of the things I love to love about working in this country is, is that it's small. So everything's kind of national. But don't you, don't you get sad that the, the the music press is kind of evaporating really? Because the music press, you know, PRs often complained about how difficult the journalists were, but my God, they made those acts seem charismatic. They made them seem think, larger um, than life. Really sad. What's sad to me, like I miss Q, and I think it's really sad that nothing's come in 
to replace that vacuum that Q left, especially for bands. You know, we have a lot of bands on our roster and I love bands. And it's very hard to get, you know, spaces, obviously all the national papers are smaller, less ads, less pages. So, you know, it's, it's difficult getting a band to feature, especially, you know, finding that angle or the interest. So I think the, the vacuum, the Q left, smash hits, the face isn't really what it was. You know, the face was great too. But I think we still have, I mean, there's so many good writers still. NME, I really miss NME not being in print. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is there anybody whose career you think you you you've uh, you've you've changed the perception of that person via publicity? You know, they well, thought of them one uh, way, and you kind of represent them as a different way, and that was kind of well. I, I think Ali, I've ha I helped, um, but I think someone like Rufus um, Wainwright, I helped him have a career, and I think he'd probably be the first to say that because um, when I I started working with Rufus just after Want One came out. And he really had had hardly any press um, in this country, um, probably anywhere. And, you know, England became a massive territory for him. Also, like Kasabian, you know, we took them on on their third album. And basically they had about four press cuts across two albums. People thought they were just this, these kind of beer drinking, football loving guys from Leicester. And, you know, they ended up, we, we, I was lucky too, you know, so much of this is luck. The first Kasabian album, West Rider was, it probably still remains their best album. And it had an explosive single called Fire that just, you know, captivated everyone. And, you know, a lot of it is luck, but um, there's so many things, you know, um, James Blunt, you know, started to work with him, he was, you know, some guy that was had been in the army and played guitar. Um, James Blunt's a really interesting example of someone who, because to some extent, people need need PRs less now because a lot of the the main agent uh, often for the information about pop Instagram. stars is the pop star themselves. Yeah. But he's done an absolutely brilliant job of turning around his perception from being a kind of a saccharine balladeer to to being this kind of really well, worked, self lampooning wit, hasn't he? Yeah, exactly. I worked his first two albums, and you know, when you're independent, obviously, then Every, they're entitled to change whenever they want. And he wanted to change. And when I worked with him in the first two records, yeah, I mean, people thought he was nothing very positive. And um, I'm working with him again. About three years ago, we started to work together again, which is really lovely. But yeah, I mean, he's completely reinvented himself on Twitter as the king of Twitter, you know, very yeah. funny, bright. And he was always like that. So tell us something we don't know about Keith Richards. At one point, you spent about a month uh, around the time of his arrest, wasn't it, when you were compiling the book? It always interested me. There was a point in the book where you ring up your parents and tell them that you're in a hotel with Keith Richards after his arrest. What do they What do they think is about interest? I think they were worried at that point, um, only because, you know, he'd just been arrested for heroin possession. And um, I mean, that my my life from when I graduated university and moved to England they were used to me traveling. I mean, you got to remember, most Americans didn't even have a passport then. Mm. You know, and I like got on a plane at 22 and moved here. But um, yeah, I think they were worried. Um, but I was always uh, sensible. And I think they I always called home frequently and kept in touch with them. Um, Keith Richards, I mean, the funny thing is, you know, everyone used to say oh he's the next to go and he'll probably outlive us all absolutely that's I know, the truth that's true, isn't it? he'll wait until we've all gone yeah i guess the thing about keith that probably people wouldn't know or be surprised the most about is he's really funny and mm. um he has a great sense of humor um he's obvious and he's really bright um you know i talking about luck you know i mean it was how fortunate that I ended up kind of doing a book on Keith Richards, just an amazing opportunity. And also like, I was lucky that what happened in Toronto happened because it kind of shaped the book, yeah. gave it a structure around which I could kind of base everything. But I was also incredibly lucky to work with Madonna. Yeah. Yeah. You look back on things that were, 
and so many others. Um, I want some flavour of just briefly of your, of your time as, 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 as well. there were very few girl writers in the early seventies. So you were there where you talk about being, you know, interviewing Brinsley Schwartz and Hawkwind and people. How did they react? They just weren't used to presumably being interviewed by by female writers. Oh, I don't think it um, it um, phased them or made much of a difference. I think for me, what made a difference was that I really like music. And I think that, you know, I remember once interviewing Steve Marriott and it was the last interview of the day. And I mean, he was gone. You, you know, you can only sit in a room for so long and be asked the same questions. Um, so the fact that like I could go in there and talk about music, cause I think, you know, you'd be shocked how stupid some journalists are, um, <laughs> especially maybe back then and didn't really do their homework. So, but I think really like, and I think that's the key to getting on with journalists too. You know, we all love what we do. We do it because we love the music. Uh, and, you know, I think again, going back to lockdown, I just kind of fell in love with my record collection again. Yeah. You know, I just like yeah. started playing just Crosby, Stills and Nash, Jackson Brown, the Eagles, you know, just like, I mean, the other day I got in the car and um, Six Music was playing um, a song from Bob Dylan's album, New Morning. It was Saturday and it was a beautiful day. I came home and like played Bob Dylan for about five hours. Yeah. You can do that. I want yeah, to ask you. Easy. I want to ask you a, a question about how the how the uh, the kind of politics of uh, of music journalism has changed. In the sense that, um, you know, back in the day when I used to interview people all the time, nobody would ever sit in and on, on an interview at all. Do you ever do that nowadays? Uh, no. You do? no. No. Uh, in fact, sometimes American managers will say will want to sit in. I always say no. It's um, so hard. You only have 45 minutes or an hour if you're lucky. And it's such a kind of, you know, you're both the artist and the journalist are supposed to have some semblance of an opinion of what each other's like. And, get to, and then the journalist is going to write about it. Yeah. Um, do, you, no, do, you ever think, say, do you ever say to a journalist, don't ask this question in the hope that by saying that, that they will ask it because you want it asked? No, I do sometimes ask not to talk about something, you know, Sometimes there's quite sensitive issues um, that you have to, you know, um, you know, for example, obviously, sadly, um, Taylor Hawkins from the Foo Fighters passed away a couple months ago. And, you know, there's certain things, um, and, and not that the band has done any interviews, but there's certain things, personal life things, if someone's pregnant, you know, a lot of that stuff is, is completely up to them to discuss. Yeah. It's funny. Mark and I were talking about this last night because I can remember you doing the PR for Eric Clapton, not long after tragically his son had done. died. And, and you sent and I was interviewing him. You said to me, don't mention Tonto. And I did. And he, he just talked about it. And he was obviously just ready to say whatever he was, he was going to say. Um, because I always think if somebody tells you not to talk about something, you always think that's where the interesting story yeah. is. Now, there's a question of how much you push it. That's that's a different thing, you know. Well, also, Eric, like you said, Eric was ready to talk about yeah. it. Also, they're grown-ups. They they can yeah. say I don't want to discuss it. No, sure. Sometimes and that, and you would respect you that. Have tell, you have to tell the artist um, if. You know, for example, with Kasabian, um, Serge has just started to do press. Tom left the band a couple of years yeah. ago. And there's a way of dealing with something and then moving on and not yeah. dwelling on it. Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm interested in what you were saying, though, about not having the manager there or not having the PR there, because the journalist and the musician have got to strike up some kind of it's almost fake intimacy, isn't it? For yeah. 45 yeah. minutes. And they've got to kind of pretend that they're the only two people in the world for that period of time, even though it's a nonsense. But as soon as you get somebody else in the room, you can't be like that at all, can you? Yeah, and also it's like if there's a band um, and the yeah. manager wants the band to do the interview, you cannot have five people sat in a room with a journalist. Absolutely. It's absolutely hopeless. No yeah. one will say anything because they're embarrassed about saying the wrong thing in front of the other. You all have to have a kind of agreed strategy. 
Exactly. And if you're transcribing the tape afterwards, yes, you can't you even know who's speaking. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. You you was, you mentioned earlier. You said now it's even worse in the world of Zoom. Obviously, the world of Zoom is exactly where we are this moment. You know, presumably, an increasing amount of the things you're organising, you're organising via Zoom. Yeah, I mean, I think um, what obviously touring and uh, is just getting back up to speed. But I would think the record companies will be loath to send someone to LA with yeah. the frequency they used to. When all they have to do is give them a Zoom link. Yeah. But the, the, the problem is that, you know, we started off when Dave and I would start doing this. I mean, I can remember interviewing Sting when he was the, the biggest rock star in the world in his house at home with just him and his son, actually. He was about four or five years old with no minders, no PRs, nobody there. All that access, all that details to write about, you know. And often it's the stuff that people say not on the tape because they're often saying the same thing to the, in all interviews. It's the details around it. It's what they're wearing and their mannerisms. And, you know, of course it is. And yeah. once you get under Zoom, you haven't even got that. You're not oh, yeah. even in a room and can't even yeah. watch the way they, all their idiosyncrasies. So I mean, it's very restricted. I mean, like being there. Um, and that's true for everyone. Um, you know, I, I hope that won't stop. Yeah. So would you, uh, you found a fantastic um, career out of music, largely music PR. And I often do think it's remarkable when I kind of look around and think, who are the top music PRs? Well, there's BC and there's a business partner, Maury Bellis, and there's, and there's Murray Chalmers or whatever. And I think these people who have been doing this ever <laughs> since I was an apple-cheeked boy. <laughs> you know, it's, it's absolutely amazing to think that you've stayed at the top of that. You know, thank you. But also, you know, it's funny. You look at a lot of the artists we like. They're still here, too. I suppose so. Yeah. I mean, I, I talk about in the book going to see Keith in a hotel in New York City after the Stones had played at Madison Square Garden, I think, in 1975. And Keith really calling me out on the way I'd ended a Claudette cover story by saying this could be the last time, which was me just trying to be clever. All right. And you think, I wrote that in 1975. <laughs> it's 2022, and they're playing Hyde Park next week. Yeah. And that's yeah. mad. Yeah. Jeez, but, but presumably, you must get, you get younger acts who must say to, they like the idea of being represented by you because you're the person who represented REM or Madonna or whoever. Do they ask, they presumably ask you to tell them stories about the good old days, do they? Sometimes. I mean, I think, again, what they like is our passion, uh, right. especially bands. You know, I think it's a, a particular skill working with bands. Um, you have to be so sensitive to the dynamic between the f three, four, five people. Yeah. And sensitive, you know, the Foo Fighters are kind of, a made in heaven band and that no one is burning with the desire to do a lot of interviews besides Dave. Yeah. So it's unfortunate it falls on Dave's shoulders, but it's also great because it's a kind of peaceful coexistence. Yeah. Whereas yeah. some acts you get, the people that aren't the front man are quite envious. Yes. And then they want to be involved in interviews. You know, we spent a couple albums where, um, Michael Stipe and Mike Mills would do interviews together. And Mike Mills played a massive part in R.E.M., uh, co-wrote a lot of songs, sang backup vocals. And the journalists would sit and just look at Michael. They wouldn't even acknowledge Mike, and which is, like, so rude. But um, so, yeah. If but you, as a journalist, you can sort of understand why, because you know, it, Mike's what Mike has to say is, is possibly more is going to have more weight. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, of course, but you can also be polite. You can be polite. No, absolutely. 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 Yeah. absolutely. Definitely. Well, there's the book. Are you, <laughs> please, are you pleased with it, Barbara? I'm thrilled. Um, I really love the design and working with Lee has been great. I mean, um, yeah, it's been really fun. You know, I've been involved in the design and the photo layout and what all the photos, which ones we use. And I also, you'll be happy to know, did the audio book myself. Oh, go for wow. Good for you. That's very good. How, how long did it take you, Barbara? That's, that's always the thing well, with the when audio I, When I went for the test, 
They said the test would be an hour, and after 15 minutes, they were like, you nailed this. Oh, oh, that's right, right. Fine. <laughs> that's really good. So how long did it take you to read the book on the audio book? To oh, record I did it, it in um, uh, four sessions that were two okay. to three hours each. Right, right. That's very good. Because so the thing about audio books is they're one thing that technology has not made any quicker. It takes you the time to read a book. It takes to read a book. It's really tiring, as you know. It's really tiring. It's incredibly yeah. tiring. Because it's like I, a different, you, when we're talking, you talk, I talk. But yeah. when you're doing the book, it's just you. Yeah. I know. And you feel more and more embarrassed if you slip up because somebody has got to edit this, you know, and what a bore it is to have to take out. All yeah. these, and someone's got to check the edit, you know. We oh, should I end by just really asking Barbara what the greatest record ever made is, Dave. Don't you think? Yeah, go on, Barbara. What's the greatest record ever what made? Is the, what is the, the greatest you know, single album, album whichever? Yeah, Either. Um, the greatest album ever made is Exile on Main Street. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I thought you might say that. All right, That's guys. a very understandable choice. And, and my okay. favorite single is Tumbling Dice. Oh, okay. oh God. <laughs> the family. All in the same <laughs> niche. <laughs> All in the same week. Very